of the media industry. They're joined by Jeffrey Katzenberg, the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder and Director of DreamWorks Animation. A round of applause, please. Thank you to Jeffrey Katzenberg and James Murdoch for joining us, joining us too. Um, I think, you know, in, in the CAN debate, we, we historically have focused on uh, technology first, and then we had a group of uh, the most powerful CMOs like Keith Weed uh, at sessions. Um, we started off with the new technology companies, and, and CAN, Terry Savage, and CAN have built. Uh, Further constituencies, apart from agencies uh, and clients, uh, they've encouraged media owners, both uh, legacy old media owners, when put it like that, and new ones to come to camp. And uh, this year, we've been trying to attract um, not only media companies, but content developers and owners. And we have two of the uh, the biggest content owner, owners in the world uh, here from the. Actually, quite similar in many respects. Um, Jeff Jeffrey is chairman and CEO of DreamWorks Animation. Uh, Jeffrey left Disney. Um, That's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 what, what was the? What was the <laughs> <laughs> It was a $250 million boot, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was a boot. What do you want? <laughs> that was Geffen came in and said, you saved your socks there. Um, and then you started DreamWorks with, with Stephen and with young David Geffen. And then you sold DreamWorks pictures to Paramount. How long ago was that? Seven, eight, about seven years ago. Seven years ago. And now you, you're focused on DreamWorks animation. And you make about two or three animated films every year. That's all you you do. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Geffen and, and Jeff control seventy percent of uh, DreamWorks. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Really. <laughs> um, it's a two billion dollar company. And then on my right is James Murdoch. Probably doesn't need any introduction. Won't stop me from introducing him. Uh, market cap of about forty-seven million dollars. A little bit bigger. That's <laughs> my place. Revenues of 30, 33 billion. Right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Films and entertainment about twenty percent, a little over twenty percent. Cable twenty percent. Newspapers eighteen. TV thirteen. And then this strange category, IMS, I initialed it as what is it? Like marketing services. Yeah, like marketing services. Percent. So it's uh, it's. Um, Marketing services, coupons, uh, freestanding inserts, things like that. Okay. And North America is about 55% of the business. Europe about 30, and Australia 16. Okay. And and you're a lifer. Yes. Well, you're not, not a lifer. Life. 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 No, last 16 years. Yeah, because you you still your own company. Yes, it's all yes. I'm speaking small business. It's good to fail sometimes. Did it you fail? learn a lot. No, it but it wasn't very good. And you did, did you graduate from university? Or did you, did you no, I'm on, I'm on what they call their a, a leave of absence. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still go back? Yeah, definitely. Okay, <laughs> all else fails, back to Harvard, was it? Yeah, I hope so. Okay, fine. Okay. And I'm about 70. <laughs> It'd be like the Rodney Dangerfield movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, um, so thanks once again. Um, we, we, many years ago, we, we sort of talked about, Terry and I talked about getting... Um, Try and get James Cameron here as well during the Avatar process. But we have the next best thing because you, this is this is the man or the company that funded uh, Avatar, and we'll get to that at some point in time. Um, I just want to try and start at the beginning. First of all, anybody wants to send any questions? M Sorrell at wpp.com. Two hours and two hours, and we'll try and respond to it. But I want to start where where I started with Paul Coleman, which is I I noticed the change in the last four or five weeks. Um, in terms of the attitude of people, not the micro, the macro. Um, Jeff, James, depends you see on where, the same? Yeah, it depends on where you are in the world. I mean, you know, uh, 
uh, I uh, actually came back last week, as you know, Martin. I actually went around the world and was here in Europe, uh, uh, Asia, Australia, South America, you know, 14 countries, about you know, 15, 16 days a period of time, literally. And depending on where you are, there's a very, you know, there's a different sense. There's a, you know, uh, certainly when you're in, uh, you know, Asia, Australia, things are pretty, pretty charged up. Very enthusiastic um, uh, business and, uh, and consumer. Uh, I think here in Europe, uh, a, a great deal of uncertainty. Probably, uh, uh, you know, the hangover of Greece and Spain and Portugal. Uh, I think it's pretty unsettling for people. Remember, we have not actually ever really come out of a rather devastating, to say the least, recession. Same thing in the States, you know, it's just we look at every day the, uh, the micro and, you know, whether, literally I think the other day, uh, you know, unemployment was, uh, uh, you know, filings were up 9,000, you know, from, from 410,000 reported to 419,000 and just that 9,000 unsettles everybody, just direction. Certainly unsettling is the president and the of the election. If they, if they, well, politics in America right now are, are, are really fractured, and so everything there is, uh, you know, in a pretty good state. James? No, I think Jeffrey's right. I mean, I think depending on where you stand, you see different things. But we definitely, I think, first of all, there is just an extraordinary shift that has been, that has been going on, and we're looking to see what are the kind of growth drivers on a going forward basis, and where are they going to come from? As we see in our, you know, in our, in our, in our, in our Asian business, you know, growing very strongly, but also in some areas where, for our business, we're often a new business going in. We're a challenger kind of company in Sky Italia or Sky Deutsche Center. There's a lot of growth in terms of taking share in markets that, on a macro basis, aren't great. But I think you're absolutely right. From a, from a sort of in the last couple of weeks, maybe maybe four or five weeks. Definitely feel, you hear people talking about it, the mood is, 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 is not great. But I think, hopefully, you know, companies uh, are in a good enough shape after the shock of 2008-9 that actually, you know, we're in a better position to go forward. And I know we feel pretty healthy about the business, we're very nervous about the macro environment. I think that's true. That's true in a lot of firms, actually. But the mood music has definitely shifted and people are, are, are fearful. Now, Jeffrey and James had dinner last night at Tetley and were plotting this session between them, plotting the agenda. So I have no control over the agenda. When we, when we uh, were discussing before in house, how many people in the audience actually believe that? Can we have a show of hands? I changed my list of questions. When we had the pre meeting, uh, Jeffrey initiated a discussion about, and we still got on it with Paul a bit, the balance between. Art and commerce is what you, where, you, where you put it, and uh, it's fundamental to Cannes because Cannes now has been renamed, as you know, the, the Festival of Creativity. It used to be about advertising purely, and it's broadened enormously. Do you want to say a little bit, Jeffrey, about well, your yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think it's something that, um, you know, my industry, Hollywood, very, very much shares in common with uh, um, many, if not most of you, that are uh, here in the room, which is, is that we are this amazing uh, uh, sort of balance between uh, uh, commerce and art. And I, I, don't, I don't mean arty art, I mean artistic and creative uh, expression. And uh, it's, a, it's a really precarious balance, you know, that, that there's a razor's edge. And when you're on the you know, skating on the edge of that, and you find that right balance between art and commerce, uh, the rewards are spectacular. And they're spectacular in any field, and whether it's James Cameron, and, you know, or a great TV show, or a great ad campaign, and it, you know, the rewards are spectacular. When those things get tipped either side of that scale, and right now, today, for a, a number of factors, particularly I, I know in, in Hollywood, I think they are out of balance. And, you know, we've just come through probably, if you look at movies out of Hollywood in the last six months, it's arguably 
the worst and least creative work product in a decade or more. It's just, you know, it's just been a poor run. And some of that's just the, you know, unique and unpredictability of it, but some of it's market forces. And there is an uncertainty right now, and, and there's a fear. And, and you know, uh, originality and creativity uh, depend on, they require uh, risk. And if you take the equation of that, risk equals some failure. And if you don't have the ability, the right, uh, the financial stability to have some degree of failure in what you do, you just go back and now you lose creativity, you lose risk in it. And so it's, it's a very uh, a delicate equation. Uh, and when it gets out of balance, I, I said to you, know, when I look at the advertising, I, I'm someone who uh, for you know, decades is an appointment uh, viewer of the Super Bowl to see the ads. I don't really care who's playing. I don't follow football. It doesn't really <laughs> matter to me. I actually go get the chips and soda when the game's on. <laughs> I, don't want to I, I, I should say, I, I, I love it. I just think it is beyond mesmerizing. Here's another thing that's interesting, which I just found out this year. It has nothing to do with anything here. So there's a football game that goes on for three and a half hours. James, you know this because the you know your network carries it. Does anybody have any guess at how long the football is actually in play in the three and a half hours of the broadcast? Three seconds. It's under fifteen minutes. <laughs> so truly, it's about the commercials. <laughs> and unfortunately, this year, my. I, I, I have no poll, I didn't do anything in it. I just didn't think it was a great year. You know, it was a disappointing year in terms of that. Why is that? I think we were talking about it, we were talking about it earlier, and I think you know, there is, and just apropos of this conversation around the economy and all of these things, I think there's, there's what we have to guard against in the creative industries, both with respect to filmmaking, television, but also advertising and the way we run businesses in general is we need to guard against fear. And this is the this is the issue. There's a real fear, I think, of failure. And and and, and when the when, when when the creative process really, really shifts towards safety in an environment of extreme pressure after having had a terrible shock um, with all of these businesses, you know, really having a big problem in their time, um, then it takes a while to get out of that. And I think I think confidence and the ability to take risk, as Jeffrey was saying, is fundamental. And I think it has shifted just sort of in general, where companies, creative companies in particular, are a little more fearful. But, you know, to the point about art and, and commerce, I think, you know, the, the art is sharper for being accountable as well, in terms of what is it trying to achieve, what are we trying to do with audiences, what are we trying to sell. So you have to, I think, see that hopefully as just a product of the cycle right now, but coming out of it, it will be, it will be good. I know personally, just not just as a, as a, uh, as someone in a, in a creative company, but as a marketeer as well, you know, you know, when you're under pressure to sell, you know, to sell subscription services, to sell newspapers, to sell TV packages, you know, you can, you know, you can be driven by commerce too much, and then you always have to guard against it and say, well, actually, am I investing enough in my brand? Am I investing enough in in, in taking big creative leaps with my brand and connecting it to customers in the right in the right way that may not be as obviously sharply accountable there? And I think we have to be very, very cautious about that because otherwise we get into a run where really we turn off our customers because we're not talking to them in an engaging, in a resonant, and in a, and in, and in a really powerful way. We, we had a debate about this before as well. Maybe there's a confidence that comes from owning 70% of the company and 40% of the votes in the company. So maybe you have a, a slightly stronger position than many people who run listed companies and indeed private companies who don't have that. That's certainty. That's the I disagree with that. Oh, okay, fine. I get that one. No. <laughs> you know what he's talking about. Um, <laughs> no, that's not, the, that's not the point. Is is that a creative endeavor, I mean, that doesn't mean you get to fail all the time. It just means that it, within the equation of how you build a business, you have a business model. We look at it in terms of our movies that we make. Um, you know, we've got a 
couple hundred million dollars in the bank, we can, you know, one of our movies misses. It's not going to take the company down. It's not going to destroy the value of the enterprise. And this is maybe because we have that, we're now 15 for 15. We've put out 15 movies in a row now over a eight year period of time the average box office of which is over $500 million. We've never actually had a miss, but because I think we have the ability to have a miss, right. it's part of that. It has nothing to do with ownership or control. I don't so why are the others not doing it? Just so we're quite clear, why, you know, when I spoke to you about coming to Cannes a few months ago as a health business, you said, oh, it's awful, basically. It's <laughs> really tough. Uh, and profitability of movies is down. And what, what needs to change? Well, are, the bean, are the bean cameras in control? No, no. Right? Hollywood is, the movie industry as a whole, is probably in its, mode, in, in its uh, most disruptive uh, point of transformation that certainly in my 40 years of being around, would, I mean, it's not even close. It's by an order of magnitude, the complexity of what is going on. And so you have a perfect storm of things that have occurred, which is first and foremost, we came into 2008 in which uh, the uh, proposition of price value for everything in anybody's life uh, was put up for re-evaluation. And in that uh, moment in time, consumers started to look at the ownership, the purchase of DVD movies in a completely different light than they had before. Uh, so, a lot of pressure on uh, price value of, do I need to buy a movie that I'm going to watch once or twice? Um, at the same time, a, a transition of new technology uh, coming into the, the marketplace, uh, not as uh, real or as realizable in the moment as uh, it, it was going to be. So you, you knew it was coming even though it wasn't there, so the impact of knowing it's coming had affected the decisions being made. So the financial pressure of going through a transition from a digital, from a, from a hard goods platform to a digital platform, which has not yet occurred, it is occurring and it is absolutely going to occur. In the fourth quarter of last year, 2% of DreamWorks animation sales were digital, 2%. 98% of it was in hard goods. And we had two top 10 performers in there. So the promise of it is coming, but the consumer is looking at and changing their, their habits at the same time that's going. So that is just a formula for a very difficult, very challenging market. So, <coughs> now, one of the reasons get, getting the two of you here, and we want to do more of this, is because we want to try and get agencies to work with content producers, content owners, the media companies, just as they do with clients. So, James, uh, what are the technologies, the technological developments that really excite you when we, we know that high def and 3D are on the agenda, iPads, but do you want to just take everybody through how you think we can build a stronger relationship and use for well I guess I guess first of all I think that the digital I think that the whole the whole marketplace we had sort of lots of we had we had lots of marketplaces in the past and today we're in what you know we, we talk about in our company is sort of the all media marketplace where everything is digital and it's very very seamless in between different product sets. So if you have a tablet for example and you want to watch one of DreamWorks movies it's a button over here, and if you want to read the Wall Street Journal, it's a button over here. And if you want to play a game, it's a button over here. So for a customer, consumption across different, well, previously different markets is now a completely straightforward and frictionless experience for a lot of customers. I think it becomes a very, very, you know, it becomes a very, very powerful product then when we think about how creatively we apply ourselves to it. So if you look at you know, in a digital marketplace, where we're able to deploy new technology faster, be it to get HD capability to all of our customers across Europe, for example, which has really revolutionized our business in Europe, uh, which is slow to come to HD, uh, much slower than the, than, the, than the U.S. for various reasons. 3D as well is something that, you know, being able to bring to customers' homes is very exciting because as a, as a sort of creative trajectory, irrespective of whether or not there have been missteps in the filmmaking, either they make good enough pictures or doesn't, 
and I know Jeffrey has lots of views on this, but you know, in, in terms of did it justify that price value proposition? We think bringing you know really much more immersive experience to customers is something that's very very exciting, both in the theater as well as in the home. That we can do that, and we we're, we're out of the home in, in, in you know in, in venues like pubs where you know 3D football, for example, in the UK has been hugely popular, where people go and make an event of it, and and, and that's not that it's a way to carry the web around with you, or it's a new digital platform. For the newspaper business, it's an incredible new paper stock that prints perfectly all the time, that has incredible color, and you can tell stories audio-visually as well as with the written word. And we're really seeing a revolution in how storytelling is happening but, but uh, in people's the, hands. That's very exciting. That has to pay for. Well, we, we believe that if we're sufficiently differentiated and we're investing in product, be it Avatar or you know maintaining bureaus in Benghazi, if that's something that's different and good, then people will take it board as long as we price it well fairly. And actually, we're seeing that happen. I mean, Do you want the to times that the UK, time the the times that I think every delegate has a password to become a Times iPad customer. Uh, but if you have an iPad, you should do that. Today. We will give it to you. You have it free for a week, and you'll see what we're doing there. But that now is outpacing all of the declines in our traditional Times business, the printed copy Times. Business. Remember that has paper associated with it that has distribution costs that are higher. We have to truck heavy, heavy things around the countries, etc. Now the Times is a newspaper that is growing pretty quickly um, on a paid-for basis when you take the total universe of customers into account. And that's something that's very, very different dynamics. So we look at our journalism business as something that's maybe one of our most exciting businesses going forward from Sky News to The Times to The Wall Street Journal. Is really core creatively for our readers and our customers. How many subscribers have you got paying for content on Times now? The last time, the last time we announced our numbers was the last quarter, so yeah. a quarter ago, it was about two hundred and thirty thousand. Um, there, and, and that's and that's in the universe, remember, of printed readers of sort of you know, just under five hundred thousand. So it's a big number. And, and Wall Street Journal. The Wall, the Wall Street Journal is a combined subscription, but it's well over a million digital customers now. No, no. Jeffrey is the man who famously said to, I don't know if it's your people or to somebody, if you don't like coming in on Saturday, don't bother to come in on Sunday. Um, and uh, you should come and work at WPP. Uh, and, but yet, yet DreamWorks, and I'm going to, I'll, I'll now to go look, DreamWorks consistently is rated one of the top 10 places to work That's right. in America. Well, you've got some very strong views on that, which you may, may want, to, want to voice. You, you were similarly very direct about 3D. You, you basically think it's not, not very good. No, I think it is probably the single greatest uh, uh, technology innovation that has come uh, as an opportunity to Hollywood in many, many decades. And, um, you know, what has been disappointing, if not nearly devastating, is how badly it's been squandered. You know, suddenly here is this amazing goose ready to lay these golden eggs, and just at the moment that it was occurring, and in fact had occurred, it occurred on Avatar, it occurred for us on uh, How to Train Your Dragon, uh, where we saw when these tools put in the hands of real, genuine uh, visionaries and talents, created an, a theater experience that was a premium. It was unlike something they had experienced before and an opportunity to bring people back to movie theaters you know, who were disappointed in that experience. There are a group of people that came along and, and uh, you know, just thought, oh, this is a good opportunity to just jack up the price of tickets and deliver a sub-quality slapped into post-production version of it and just like that, just because of the way the world works today, the consumer instantly has been burned and turned off. And, uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity to bring them back. I, I actually believe that a movie coming out in 10 days, uh, the next Transformer films in which Michael Bay, who actually does know how to use uh, these kinds of technology tools you know, in, a, in an amazing, an amazing way, I think can set the bar back high again. But, you know, uh, it, it really was very disheartening to see uh, people come in and just make a fast buck and try and pull the wool over the consumer's eyes. And, 
you know, and quickly get smacked back. And as you'll comment about the fresh in the clock. I don't remember saying that. I don't remember saying that. <laughs> but I think the other thing is it happened right at a time, as Jeff was saying, where customers were making hard choices about where they were going to invest for their families, right? So it happened, you know, as the 3D stuff sort of really took off in 2009, really, that was exactly the same moment where people were saying, hang on a minute, you know, if I'm going to go out to the theater and I'm taking my two kids or whatever it is, this is now starting to be, you know, a $100 outing um, for a family of, a family of four uh, with food and all that sort of nonsense. So it became, it was exactly the wrong time just to kind of take, take a, you know, create a position where you were fundamentally not on the side of your customer. And you weren't um, delivering, and customers you, weren't delivering you weren't delivering what you promised. Yeah. Now, just, just when we talked about you coming to Cannes, Jeffrey, you, you, you said there was some technology you were developing that would be of interest to our industry, and, hope, and you say it's not ready yet, it, it's coming, so hopefully we can entice you back again to show everybody here uh, the impact on it. But you're a, you've become a director of Zynga. I do you want to tell us a little bit about why you did that, what you see in the game? Yeah, well, but I, just to, you know, t you know um, just in a, uh, an amazing way, which is, um, you know, technology is actually the friend of the artist and uh, is a very, we're seeing more and more how, how, how these tools are, are so powerful, putting, the, putting them in the hands of, of artists and is allowing them to realize and create images and stories and you know visual experiences that are richer and richer and richer and um, you know I, I you know for us on every single movie we make it is a stated goal to actually try and exceed our customers' expectations and 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 that is where technology continues to be a, a great value uh, for us and we are working on some things that will revolutionize. Not just the image, not just how we make the images, but the end images themselves, and they will be relevant to the advertising industry. <laughs> They're about a year or so uh, away. It's something we've done in conjunction with Intel. Um, in terms of Zenga, uh, you know, I I just see, uh, as I think we all do, how uh, powerful and impactful uh, what is sort of a, a, a new a form of entertainment. And I think that entertainment is in its infancy. I think that if we were to make the analogy, it's kind of where silent film was. So I think it has literally that level of trajectory in terms of where it is today. It's basic, it's very, very compelling, it's very engaging. It has, uh, it's very simplistic in it, uh, in terms of the uh, imaging and the uh, storytelling, but it works like gangbusters, and I just think it is going to continue to grow and be explosive. And I think Mark Pincus is one of the real, entre you know, great entrepreneurs and real creative visionaries. So to be on the inside and watching that place uh, uh, take off and grow the way it is is frankly teaching me uh, uh, in, in so all more, kinds of it's ways. It's more than teaching you than you're teaching them. I, well, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, you have to ask them on the other side of it. I, I hope I'm bringing value okay, to them. One, but one, one thing just occurred to me as you were talking about, if we talk a lot about our industry about size and, and scale and, and the like. You produce two or three films a year. Is size the enemy of creativity? I mean, is part of you, your commentary about at the beginning about art and commerce that the bigger these companies become, the worse they get? It doesn't have to be. Um, you know, I mean, News Corp is one of the largest companies in the world, media companies in the world, and, you know, in almost every area they function in, there's a, a, a line of uh, products that they come out with that are exceptional. You know, they have exceptional big blockbuster movies, they have exceptional art films, make some of the greatest television shows, you know, now had reinvented American Idol for, you know, one more go around. That was a creative challenge. To make that show, you know, which had been sort of declining in interest and to bring in a group of people and to actually remake that into something that is now re-energized again, that's an incredible accomplishment I and mean, that's happened rarely. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't think that size necessarily. Is the For me personally, it's, I'm, I'm excited by being able to focus a huge amount of time and energy to a very small number of things that 
you know, just excite me and I don't know, there's enough size and scale to it keeps me plenty busy. So okay. no. I think it's one of the big challenges though, if I can just elaborate on that, because as a you know, for us Really, you know, as a you know, we're a large company. We're sort of a, we're, 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 we're a, we have lots and lots of companies as part of the group, and we have lots of brands from you know Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal to Fox or Star to the Sky Brands, um, and 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 these businesses are National Geographic. And the real issue is how do we keep the sort of creative culture and how do we keep that commitment to making sure people can be entrepreneurial, making sure they can take risks here. Making sure that they, you know, it's okay if they take a risk and they feel it's better than not taking a risk and not doing anything. All of those cultural pressures are much higher. And the real issue becomes, though, that as the competitive set shifts, we're not big enough. So when you actually look at the competitive set in the in an all media marketplace where you have, you know, sort of monolithic brands from Google and Apple, etc., to you know the big former PTTs, from Telefonica to Deutsche Telekom, or you know. Um, Verizon, et cetera, the sort of all the kind of characters on a playing field or a terrain that has essentially collapsed, there are much, much bigger beasts than a news corporation or a, a Time Warner or whatever it is. And that is a real challenge for us going forward. And how do we make sure that we can compete at scale globally as these new players do, um, and these established players do, and still be quick and creative and risk-taking? And I think it's something that's very much unresolved and a big, a big factor of how this thing plays out over the next five to ten years is going to be how we do that and how we actually make ourselves as good at a much bigger scale as we can be, um, because otherwise we will fail. So B Sky B is just the beginning? Well look, I think the Sky business, all the Sky businesses around the world, there are six Skies around the world from you know, New Zealand to India to Germany, Italy and the, and the, and the, and the UK and so forth. Australian TV platform, it's not called something. But it's a, uh, but they're, you know, each one of them, our media business is one that's a local business in, all, in every place, right? Because consumers' tastes are local, they tell stories in different ways, there's a completely different thing that they sort of set aside if you're looking at a Bollywood kind of viewer versus someone in, in South America. Um, but the sort of national nature of those businesses doesn't work well with competing on a global basis with sort of, you know, monolithic brands like Google, right? We cooperate with Google a lot as well, but, you know, there's also a competitive dynamic. For so they were friends. This is your, your you like well, that's not mine. It, 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 was a, it was a young woman who, from Harvard Business School, actually, who, who uh, coined that phrase. It wasn't mine. I, 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 I nicked it. But look, the, but the fact of the matter is, these are comp this is a complex business environment, right? We have to be, you have to be sort of mature enough to say, listen, you're going to have deep partnerships with companies that you're going to be trying to absolutely throttle over here, right? And you have to be, and I think you have to remember all the time that you're playing the ball, not the man, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have great partnerships with, you know, um, a great partnership, for example, with ESPN in Asia, where we're partners in a big sports business across Asia, particularly in India. Um, yet in the U.S., our Fox Sports regional business and ESPN are at each other for rights, for customers, for viewers, and that's you know, and that's fine. And I think, and I think with Google, you know, we have lots of relationships with all of the digital marketplace. You know, connecting to our customers and our viewers via Facebook. You, you know, using the whole social sort of element to a digital marketplace, and it's fundamental the way we market things, the way we deal with our customers, the way we provide them new services. But at the same time, there is a, there's a competition for people's time and attention that is, that's relevant for all of us. Now, we talked about the power of tablets, and we talked a little bit about, you know, when, we, when we go to the Allen Company, Sun Valley Conference, on the list of attendees always, Steve Jobs is always listed as a, an attendee, but never comes. You, you know Steve well, Jeff, and you have, a, as we all do, a tremendous admiration for what he's done and what we're sure he will still do. Do you want to say a little bit about the power of tablets? Um, well, I haven't seen Stephen, you know, I saw him last spring, but, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I wish I had, I wish I had more contact with him uh, over the years, uh, but when the tablet came out and I had a chance to chat with him a little bit of, about having an opportunity to experience it myself, I think it is um, uh, arguably um, the most powerful and impactful device that's been created in our lifetime, for sure, maybe, certainly, maybe to date of anything. And we're only beginning to see the, 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 
you know, what are the opportunities and the implications of it. And so whether you look at it as a, uh, an educational device where literally three and four and five year olds, you know, will have, you know, simplistic versions of these. But in terms of engaging uh, kids at a very young age and giving them access to uh, information and education and just developmental skills, it's just a mind-blowing device. And the thing that I think is ultimately so compelling about it and so genius about it is it, it actually should have been called the Mi Pad, not the iPad, because every one of these is a direct reflection of who we are personally. personally. Um, it is like looking in the mirror uh, when, you, when you look at what are the, the apps that you have on it that it actually tells you uh, or, or can tell one so much about who somebody is and what their interests are and what they, what they, what they want to know about and what the, how they go about their life and this and then I was telling James, I was with uh, Jim Giannopoulos two days ago in a meeting and he had his iPad and I took his iPad away from him you know, and, and grabbed it just like I'm grabbing yours, Martin. And, <laughs> and, okay. and, 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 I, and I quickly went to the front page of it um, and I wasn't actually interested in any of the actual business they were doing. But I'm so fascinated at being able to look at the, you know, the icons here because, you know, the fact that there is so much pornography on them, <laughs> just an amazing amount about this very, I hope this is the word part because this is pretty sick. Anyway, uh, uh, but, you know, when you, when, you, when you look at it in terms of, again, just the things that are on here, you know, productivity and shopping and social and travel and... I literally could take one of these things and uh, it, it, it would tell you everything about the owner of this or so much about the owner of this. And that is the power of the device. And you said this, you started with a new, new journey. So, so, so we're just at the beginning of the journey. Well, that's what's so interesting about it is that this thing is going in leaps and bounds. And I think the real, there's been a breakthrough in terms of some of the hard engineering work that goes into developing a multi-touch screen that works, doing it in a weight and a battery life that works, and all of those sort of difficult things. You have that, you have a connected environment with Wi-Fi coming 4G and all of this sort of business. And essentially, you know, it is, you know, this, this thing is just, this thing is brand new. I mean, this thing launched back, you know, this, this year, right? Or this last year. Literally, literally got it's eight, eight, one year. brand new. And, you know, the journey started with, you know, talking about personal computers and the tablets, the, the old Newton platform, it was then the Palm stuff and all of this thing. So where are we going to be 10 years from now is a completely different place. And you'll have, you know, these things will be more flexible, lighter. So, so I think the synchronicity between these screens is what's going to become so powerful. Right. So here's one that just, I, I am convinced, and if I didn't have a full-time job, I'd go do this in a second tomorrow because I, somebody is going to do this and it is going to become a force beyond anything Hollywood has ever seen before. Here it is. Uh, somebody's going to create a, you know, a website here um, in which uh, you'll subscribe to it. Um, you'll go on and you'll answer 10 questions about movies, things you like, you don't like, you historically like, um, and it will automatically aggregate you to a group of people who actually think and like, have those same likes that we do. We see this kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, factoring and, and uh, predictability of uh, being built into these things. And so what will happen is now on Friday, you'll, you'll, you know, when a movie's coming out, you'll, you actually will go online, you'll go to this website, you'll go to that group of people, and by the way, there could be 5,000 people that think like you, or 5 million people that think like you in this. You will know with a high degree of predictability whether you actually want to go see that movie or not. Now here's the good news, bad news about it. It actually means movies have to be good. <laughs> you can't get away with the idea that you could just simply market a marketability. You know, one of the things that is probably slightly out of whack today and in my world is, is that there is too much emphasis on marketability and not enough on playability. This is going to literally yank that back into playability being 
the single most powerful uh, 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 element that you, that, you have, that you have to succeed at as a story. It's a really interesting. It's a really interesting point because in a digital, see, it strikes me in a digital environment that's completely connected. What you have, and there's a lot of talk here in Canada about you know the social aspects of things and that. Really, you know, the social dimension of a digital connected environment, which is which is manifest, it's there, right? Really, is so crucial precisely for this reason because it's about first of all, there's really not there's going to be nowhere to hide, right, for products that can't stack up, right, or for creators who maybe haven't been doing their best jobs. There's nowhere to hide, number one, but also it's very hard to find things simultaneously. So the social aspect of discovery is going to be necessary when you have kind of that much plurality. So I think for every brand, for every product, for, from a movie to a... I'm going to blog and be in here with these guys. I needed a picture. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, this is something, this, this, this dynamic is fundamental. And I think being able to use the social tools to actually discover products, content, whatever it is, is going to be necessary. Because otherwise you're just going to be lost yeah. in an environment of plurality that is so extreme, you'll end up not discovering anything. And that's the sort of paradox of that environment. Now, Jeff, Jeffrey touched on the educational value of the tablet. You're building a, an education business. Joe Kleinman, who used to run the schools in uh, New York, has joined News Corp and his work. You made your first acquisition, I think, yeah. uh, in the education. Yeah. Do you want to say a little sure. bit about the, the, the role of education? Sure. We bought, we bought, we, we acquired a small company, not well, a small but a company called a uh, startup called Wireless Generation, which is bringing digital technology to schools, particularly around assessment, and it's to the point of nowhere to hide, right? I mean, one of the key things here is how do you get, how do you become very, very data-driven and making kids get better grades and giving them a better education? And we're not that data-driven today in classrooms. And I guess our view is that in, you know, classrooms around the world, with the exception of some kind of real innovators out there, pretty much they're the same today as they were 50 years ago. There's somebody standing in front of a bunch of kids, maybe 40 kids, something like that, and they've got a blackboard or a whiteboard or something, whatever the equivalent is. And they're trying to create, and they're working hard, and they're trying to create a dynamic that, can, that, that they can help these kids learn. Our view is that that is an area that is really the next place where digital technology is going to create a revolution, right? And it's going to be a revolution around individualized teaching, it's going to be around assessment and teacher performance as well, and it's going to be around cost. Because we basically live in a society where, in all our societies, very huge investments have been made in our education system, but the outputs aren't right. So over time, you can look at the data and say, well, what we've, what we've essentially been investing in is more teachers, right? And that's been, that's been the big bet in Western society around education policy. Um, and it hasn't gotten the right outcome, and we're seeing scores go down in the West and all these things. So you really have to turn that on its head and say, actually, what we need to invest in is the technology here to actually make it much more individualized for students. But frankly, when we find good teachers, what is the technology that can get them in front of as many kids as possible? And that's really the different dynamic that's happening now. And I think, you know, early stages shows that real time, you know, when you get these tablets and you get it all connected properly in a, in a, in a, in a school, the curriculum is more engaging to the point that Jeffrey was making about kids enjoying, sort of, you know, interacting with multi-touch screens and doing these things. Um, assessment is in real time, so you get much, much better results uh, very quickly, and you can really tackle if a kid's falling behind, or if a kid needs to be challenged more because they're, they're doing better. Um, and teachers are also accountable in a way that is, you know, completely different um, from the sort of process-driven accountability that's been in the past. So we're very excited about it, and we think, you know, it's a new business for us, but we think a place where, you know, there are a number of companies doing a good job, and everyone's focused on this from Cody Mifflin to others, etc. But there's a big amount of room to go in and actually create something new and really innovative. You mention this. Well, I mean, there's a, there, there, I mean, I think, in, I think incumbency is really a, a, a hard thing. Um, and Pearson's focusing a lot on digital education, actually. They, you know, they, they've made some acquisitions as well. But I think, um, generally speaking, I think it's a hard thing when a, with, with, for the market leader to really transform itself. And market leaders rarely have the appetite for change that they need to have to compete. And that's a challenge for every company. But they're a great company and they've done incredible things. So it's going to be a very competitive marketplace, but it's going to grow. Okay. Now, I, I, I'd like to turn to um, two countries that you know, obviously, China just won its uh, first Grand Prix here uh, this year, India two years ago. The right agency won both, but I won't go further than that. Uh, we'll wait for the plug. No, <laughs> you don't get a, it's a much more subtle plug. You know, China, China, Jeffrey, for you has been 
more than a home run. It's been a World Series. Um, Kung Fu Panda 2 has done incredibly well. The highest grossing picture in China? Well, after Avatar. <laughs> but it is, it just shows the explosive uh, growth of China, uh, the opportunity of China, the challenge and frustrations of, uh, of China. Uh, Kung Fu Panda, which uh, came out a few weeks ago, uh, is going to end up grossing $90 million uh, in, the, in the country, which is uh, extraordinary. It was released on uh, 5,500 screens, 4,000 of which were 3D. In North America, it was released on 7,200 screens, about 3,600 of which were 3D. So just to show you, they're building, uh, I am told, at the rate of two and a half new screens per day. So in four years, five years, it'll be the biggest movie marketplace in the world. And, uh, you know, I think the balance of what's going on is that what China wants, needs, deserves is an indigenous uh, movie, television, animation, uh, uh, creation, uh, uh, a business. And that's uh, a, a fantastic opportunity and, you know, one that I, 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 I hope we'll all uh, join in. I think they're less interested in simply <laughs> exporting others products into the, uh, to the country. There's a high degree of um, uh, uh, censorship, not on our movies. I have to say, we've, we've, every single one of our movies has been imported and given a, a license into the country, but we've never been asked to censor a frame out of the film, never. Uh, but, but it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, culture, different government, different society in that regard. And, so there are those issues, and I think that's what they're going to struggle with, is, is that to fill these theaters, fill these channels, fill the uh, customers and the consumer uh, opportunity there is going to take um, expression, creative expression, movies, television, art, uh, and I, at the same time, they're not comfortable with that yet. So you, you they, there's gonna, a tension. Do you think they're going to have to get comfortable with well, they will. I mean, listen, they're way more comfortable with it today than they were. It's not by our standards, but by their standards. Uh, uh, you know, what you see that's gone on in that country in the last 20 years is remarkable. Um, by our standards, it's still very, very, very restrictive. Now, James, as a media owner, life in China is much tougher for a, a foreigner. Yeah, it's, it is tough. It is tough. But I mean, particularly in, sort of in, in, in the television and, 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 uh, and business, it's... It is tough, but it's um, but you know, this is this, there are extraordinary companies in China that are doing well. I mean, we're an investor. We were a founding investor in Phoenix Satellite TV there, which has been really the only independent TV kind of company there. We're a minority investor in that. We're a partner with um, uh, we, have, we have a partnership with Shanghai, a derivative of sort of Shanghai Media and others, where we're uh, a large minority, forty percent. Um, but uh, that's a, that's we've taken our domestic TV business and we've put it into that joint venture. Because ultimately, we concluded after being in China for a long time, really, you know, to have a domestic business, you really have to be, you know, it has to be a Chinese business. Um, and, it be, and, and it's very, from a regulatory perspective, from other things, it's just too difficult. You contrast that with what's happened in India, and you have, you know, both we've had a, you know, a revolution in, uh, from a creative perspective in India over the last you know, dozen years or so on television where the quality and the diversity and the creativity of the Indian television production community has just gone from strength to strength. Obviously Bollywood, well established, vibrant creative industry there, very fragmented, so independent producers everywhere making you know good, good, very good uh, returns. And foreign investment very possible. I mean we, we've made you know we've made some very successful um, Indian pictures as well as you know we're the largest broadcaster in India today with Star, uh, the Star group of channels in you know, multiple languages, from Marathi to Malayalam to um, uh, the core sort of Hindi northern market. So it's a fundamentally different place. And I think this notion of, as chaotic as it is, and they don't have the 3D infrastructure and all of that sort of stuff, the, you know, the, the, the tradition of free expression and the, sort of the, the rough and tumble of that competitive marketplace driven by enterprise to create things that are great and appeal to people has produced a very different result than a more tightly controlled, top-down sort of thing. And that's, and that's Jeffrey's exactly right. That is where that tension is, to fill those theaters and to do all those things. You're going to need a lot of different enterprises 
really taking risks in terms of storytelling and doing it at a quality level that is, you know, that's not, that it has to punch, you know, at a global weight class. After Steven Spielberg, he went to Anil Ambani and got, what, $500 million for his production budget? So he went to India because he couldn't get them for, on the right terms, presumably, in Hollywood. Well, there's a, you know, again, uh, there's a great enthusiasm for uh, uh, bringing, um, I think, um, uh, Western movie making uh, there. Uh, uh, Reliance, the Ambani uh, companies, they are the largest exhibitor in the country, they're the largest distributor in the country, they're, you know, one of the larger uh, telcos and so forth, and, and television companies, so they're, you know, they're, they're trying to build out, and I think they saw this as a, you know, as a good investment in, one, learning, and two, then being able to import that knowledge. Um, now, what, one of the things that has been debated here at Cannes, as we draw to a close the last five minutes or so, um, one thing that's been debated at Cannes is the amazing performance of television, traditional television, uh, free to air. The rebound that we saw in 2010, and to some extent, has continued into 2011, and the upfronts, as you know, were very strong. I mean, they were double digit, close to double digit, in, in the increase in the CPM. So inflation in network television has been very significant. How do you explain the strength of TV? I think, and I think, I would, I would, I would, I would say that the, the, the success of TV has not been limited to free-to-air TV. I mean, in America, okay. in America it's harder to say because you have almost ubiquitous pay television distribution. So, and now the retransmission consent, everyone's watching on the same networks. But the point is, mass market sort of televisual entertainment has been going through a renaissance, I, I believe, where you know, it's interesting relative to what Jeffrey started with, talking about the sort of balance between art and commerce and filmmaking or in advertising this, the television business has been incredible creatively, um, just extraordinary with respect to, you know, you know franchises that are in the U.S., from, a, from, a, from, from an idol to uh, uh, Sons of Anarchy, to new productions that are, you know, everywhere around the world. We've just announced we're investing in Sky in the U.K., we're going to be making, we're going to be increasing dramatically our investment in local production there to 600 million pounds a year. So I think, you know, this is something that with the right mix of investment and the right level of risk taking, you know, you just have an enormously creative, enormous creative moment right now where there are lots of producers, lots of writers, lots of people who are just doing a good job. I think some of them maybe that we're used to television shows failing, right? In the U.S., you know, you go and you throw a bunch of new TV shows out in the fall, uh, traditionally, and a bunch of them will fail, and they get yanked, and you try something different, and you do this and that. And, you know, but that's, and that's okay, and everybody knows that, and you have sort of an attrition rate that's pretty ruthless, and then you have some stuff that comes through very, very, very well. But it has been extraordinary. I think as well, there's been, you What's know, the diversification. You look at the diversification of cable, you know, it's just been a blockbuster for creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when you, when you look at, um, you know, what is being produced, whether it's by AMC or Turner or Showtime or HBO, it's, it, it's, it's, it's moved into um, a very diverse and very vibrant and very, very, um, you know, I think rich world in which broadcasting is sort of been redefined mm -hmm. in terms of what, you know, what people want. And that diversity is just at the very beginning, the penetration of diversity like that is at the very beginning in Western Europe and, in, and particularly in Asia. So where you have, you know, where you don't have multi-channel television in every household, you don't have pay television providing the funds actually for, for, for creative producers to actually have some certainty and move forward. So I actually think, you know, this is a wave that's going to keep going. So I just want some questions from people. Mark. Yeah, here we go. Ben, Le ben Lilly, Morgan Spurlock's latest film is funded exclusively by advertisers. This is for you, Jeff. Is this a glimpse of the future of filmmaking, or what does this mean for, mean for original creative storytelling? Well, I think, you know, I think that, again, uh, there is probably uh, uh, a, a place in the uh, filmmaking world for, uh, again, what is a very niche uh, film and, and, and this sort of narrow casting, you know, we spend, you know, $150 million making an animated film, four years with 400 people and $175 million marketing it. We're in the, you know, four quadrant worldwide uh, business. 
um, and that's a very, very different enterprise. But uh, you know, so that's the high end of it. You know, our two movies are two of the ten most expensive films produced each year, and then we have to perform in the top ten or fifteen in order to succeed. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, News Corp had some just some blockbuster success. Uh, Black Swan and uh, uh, you know, some of the films that have come out of you know the Searchlight division. You know, so yeah, I think there is a place for. One, one for James. What's the future of that? This is, comes from John Woodward. What's the future of advertising in digital newspapers like Times on iPad? How can it provide value for customers? What role will it play in the financial model? How different will it be from what we know today? Well, I think I think newspaper advertising is going through. You know, uh, is going to be. Is going to go through a great period actually, because when you look at you look at these tablets, you know, or even like the Kindle, which has been really successful, and a lot of our customers in the Journal and the Times actually read it on the Kindle as well. That being able to, it's been very resilient actually. The, um, but I mean, we're seeing really a revolution in reading, and I think that's bringing journalism and written word journalism to a, to a new audience with much more capability in the devices they have. So. For us, we look at it and see as more and more of our customers, as a percentage of our total customers, consume the Times, for example, digitally as opposed to in you know a printed product that has to be delivered to them and is static. Uh, once it's printed, it's done. This dynamic digital product is something that is you know is is a flagship product, and we want to be able to take our advertisers across the piece and say. For the digital part of that buy, we want you to be able to do more things. We want you to connect directly with your customers. We want to be able to, to tell more stories for you, put in a lot more features, depending on what our clients and what our advertisers want to do. And I just encourage you to use our products. I mean, the Times Digital Edition is something that really does do a lot more for advertisers. And I'm, I'm inclined to say if we can solve that advertising piece over the next few years, and you hosted an event with us in, in London, I thank you for that, to bring a bunch of clients in to look at this stuff is actually, you know, our returns and our yields on that product are actually better than in the very expensive, physical, you know, printed product that we have to, you know, we have to mill, run through, run through printing presses, put on trucks, get out to a newsstand, uh, order your house. This is a much more flexible product that actually, we have every incentive to grow and drive, but we want to bring our advertisers with us there because it's really where they're going to have the biggest connection with their customers creatively, I think. A cheeky one from Lucas Pierre Bessis. Uh, the owner of the Italian media, if you, Jeff, the owner of the Italian media company, Fininvest, mm -hmm. went into politics to grow successfully in market share. Will James run for president, or at least governor, and if yes, in which country? Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I think I was waving at you over uh, there. Don't worry about it. Ignore him. I've got okay. two more questions uh, for you. No, I think, uh, I, think the, I think the Prime Minister's kind of unique uh, business model there so is one that we would probably be best to avoid. One will be the appropriate word. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeffrey, yes. you're, you're heavily involved in politics. You're, you're a media mobile. But is Obama going to get re-elected? Yes. Well, you're <laughs> <not>. <laughs> yes.
and people, look, our politicians have forgotten that. When you had the head of the Senate, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell, openly say in the New York Times last, the earlier this week, that I don't care what the issue is, I don't care what the circumstances are. If Barack Obama is for it, I'm against it. What the hell is that? So, Jeff, tough. Okay. Sorry. I'm not going to touch that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come to a much hotter <laughs> potato. Uh, I, are you going to buy Formula One? Well, you're the chairman of Formula One. No, I'm not. <laughs> you can't ask me that question. I'm not exactly. Thank you. A big thank you to Jeffrey.